not enough people do that what they want. I remember selling cold drinks um, on the construction site in Moscow when it was like 40 degrees. I was 13 years old, maybe younger. And I had to uh, like ask like some person from, from, from the street, some stranger to buy a uh, beer because I was not allowed to buy beer. And then I had to sort of talk with him really kindly that it's not for me and it's not for my parents, but honestly, I'm just doing business here. <laughs> Hello, friends, and welcome to Wisdom Nuggets Unlocked, the show that brings you exclusive interviews with highly successful people in their respective fields who made a mark in their world. My name is David, and besides my own newsletter, Wisdom Nuggets, I am a blogger and influencer and currently study law in Seoul, South Korea. With that being said, today we have a very, very special guest. I know him from one of my previous pitches actually we were competitors at that time um but now as you can see we're we're good friends now <laughs> he is 27 years old and at this age already founded three businesses very successful businesses actually and won a competition hosted by elon musk with his team uh, where they competed against 400 teams worldwide he runs marathons in his free time and is in general, just a very inspiring uh, person to talk to. So welcome to the show, Dimitri. Thanks. Thanks, David, for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure. I'm super honored to be here. And uh, yeah, looking forward to our talk. So excited. Thank you so much for joining. I uh, really find your story uh, interesting and inspirational. That's why I wanted the audience to gain from your knowledge as well. You uh, grew up and you were born in Russia, right? I lived here for the first 20 years of my life. Um, or maybe even more <laughs> and I actually started my starting way um, there as well and uh, live in Germany only since 2017 so not that long time ago. I want to dive deep into your uh, story because not only were you born in Russia but you actually also founded your first business in Russia if I'm not mistaken and then you moved to Germany and founded two more businesses so can you just kind of elaborate on your process little Dima back in, in in Russia and why he basically then decided to move to Germany and, and founded other businesses there. Yeah, it's um, really fun to look back because, uh, um, you know, looking back, I can connect all the dots and uh, see that it all makes sense. But back then, little Dima didn't know, I like, had no clue what was going on. Um, but yeah, I finished school and um, in, in Moscow and um, was more or less foc focusing myself on like math and physics and as a teenager uh, just after school i had no clue what i wanted to do and um, i think i just didn't pay my at much attention to choosing you know the specialization which i want to study the, the the university to go to and i started studying um, applied math in the um, oil and gas university <laughs> which is now really fun to think about <laughs> Um, yeah, because I'm rather going the green direction these days and not the <laughs> oil and gas. But yeah, come on, it was 2014. <laughs> so um, yeah, and I thought with applied math, um, I can decide later what I want to do. And it's kind of just a tool which I can uh, um, use for myself. And I was interested in physics, in geology and um, geophysics. Um, and oil and gas seems like a <laughs> an interesting um, area to be. But really quickly, I realized that applied math is not that applied, that I'm not actually not that, um, you know, excited about the whole educational um, system and rather prefer learning things by doing. And it actually, as a, a coincidence, I think, um, um, it was 2014, I believe, um, when my mother uh, broke her phone and um, I was repairing it. Um, Thanks a lot to her that she actually entrusted it to me because back then it was kind of a big purchase and then uh, <laughs> it was the first iPhone in the family. And uh, I didn't tell her, but I was actually experimenting and I managed to upgrade her memory basically from the 16 gigabyte, or maybe it was even eight back then, to like 32 or 64. And I posted that on Instagram back then. I think that's that's that that post is still up there. It was possible because we had like uh, jailbreaks and um, iPhones were not that well protected. Um, and yeah, a few friends started reaching out saying, uh, wow, exciting. Can you do the same for me? And, uh, yeah, I've been doing the same for a couple of other people. And at some point I realized, um, that I actually enjoy doing it, but it's also a good way of earning, um, yeah, some pocket money. Yeah. And, um, 
Wait, quick question. Um, back then, you were around 18, right? Back then. So not so little Dima was in his in his garage and just like repaired the, the, the phone. Yeah, it was my room. I back then, <laughs> sorry, I live with my parents. That's sort of normal. Um, um, and even like shared room and my mom was, um, you know, from time to time passing by, making sure that everything going well at the university. And I remember that I, at some point was trying to hide that I'm actually focusing way more on my new baby business. <laughs> and, um, cause literally like I was doing this in the evenings and at nights. And yeah. at some point when I realized that, um, there is a demand and, uh, with just offering, um, a service on a different level and, uh, targeting, you know, customers who don't have time and who want to have a very transparent, um, approach to that what's happening with their device. I was gaining some attention and I didn't have money to start from. So at the beginning, um, those were friends who were, um, you know, PayPaling, PayPaling me the deposit. And then I was ordering it, um, either from, um, China or from the local electronics markets. And, um, but after some time I did have some budget and, uh, to make some pre-orders myself and yeah, that started growing. And then, um, a couple of people also worked with me, um, which also didn't have a clue about repairing iPhones, but, um, yeah, they were sort of my half and hands and we we're doing this thing together. And uh, I was, yeah, really excited about that. And I thought that is why I want to become an engineer. And so it's like a teaser to why I moved to Germany, because <laughs> I thought German engineering, that's the way to go. Um, and later on, um, I just realized that I actually enjoyed the whole, you know, customer acquisition part, the whole communication, figuring out how to do marketing if you have zero budget. I enjoyed way more than, uh, yeah, sitting down in my room and um, deassembling iPhones. I enjoyed it as well, but I guess that was the combination which I was excited about. Would you say that by coincidence you found this, your entrepreneurial spirit? Or since you were even younger, you already always thought about maybe I want to become an entrepreneur in a specific field. I know you said that you wanted to study mathematics first, but was the entrepreneurship journey in your mind back then as well somewhere? I not sure I knew what entrepreneurship is. <laughs> um, like my mother is a teacher or she works at school and my father works at a, a factory, I think for the last 40 years or as long as I'm on this planet. Um, I was always going the way and growing up with the thought that, um, yeah, I got to find a position at a company and stay with this company for my whole life to have a stable and a sort of successful life. And uh, looking at the uh, world and at work as a place where I yeah, got to earn money in order to sustain myself and, you know, be safe and have those basics around me. I think my uh, parents really did great is that they were just always saying yes to the different crazy ideas which I had. May they maybe were questioning it. Like, uh, you know, when you're talking with an investor, an investor like starts throwing questions into you <laughs> and they were doing the same. Like, does it even make sense? Why are you uh, <laughs> ordering those, those, those parts from China? <laughs> so you had your first pitch uh, towards your parents back then. <laughs> Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I had to elaborate somehow why I'm doing this stuff during the examination phase. <laughs> That's super interesting. Like, but how did you teach yourself to, to repair the, the phones and stuff? Like back then there weren't a lot of tutorials on the internet, I, I believe. Frankly, I didn't need any prior knowledge. And I think that anybody could start. Then you just, um, reach certain level where you understand, um, that you need some special tools or you need some special knowledge. Uh, to work with, uh, you know, circuits. And I, frankly, at some moment, I just stopped and said, yeah, it doesn't make sense to go that deep because um, I'm not doing this, you know, full, full time and still trying to focus um, on the university. But I started from YouTube, like YouTube had some, um, yeah, some tutorials. I think I didn't understand what people were saying at the videos because those were in Chinese, but <laughs> I kind of saw what was happening on the screen. And as I said, I was just excited actually about this communication with the customer and, uh, about realizing the, the, you know, the need, which was there and solving the problem. And, um, that was actually also not the first thing which I was trying to do. I was like, I liked, um, finding the problems which were not solved. Probably the first thing now, if I look back where, which you would consider as an like entrepreneurial thinking. I remember selling cold drinks um, on the construction site in Moscow when it was like 40 degrees. <laughs> and the thing is that 
I I was not uh, even 18. I think it was like 14 or 13 years old, maybe younger. And I had to uh, like ask a, uh, a like some person from 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 the street, some stranger, to buy a uh, beer because I was not allowed to buy beer. And I had to sort of <laughs> <laughs> talk with him really kindly that it's not for me and it's not for my parents. But honestly, I'm just doing business here. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, I mean, I just like the process. And uh, I was not doing that in the very beginning for for money, but at some point when I saw that actually. Uh, you know, you can make some money with this, then I've also realized that honestly, talking to myself, financial um, motivation is there. And I think it's also important for entrepreneurs just to be, you know, honest um, to yourself and realize where exactly this need is coming from. Is it just like curiosity? Is it just financial? Is it like a mix of different things? Is it because sometimes I hear people saying, um, okay, I'm an entrepreneur because I want to um, improve the world and make it better. And then I see what the person is doing, and it's like a typical, you know, B two B SaaS solution, which has not that much uh, to do with uh, improving our world right now. And I wouldn't be able to t say that I'm passionate, like I can be passionate about, but you know, doing B two B SaaS. But I think that it's honest to say I'm using this as a tool to then later somehow make the steps in order to make the world better. So um, I think I'm starting over complicating it, but I hope you get what I mean. <laughs> Basically, you are saying that in order to have a great impact on the world, you need to reach a certain level of success first. And that's what you're trying to do right now. Are you already achieved it, right? Yes, this makes a lot of sense what you're saying. Um, I would love to, right? I would love to found the company out of university, which, um, you know, changes the world. Um, but just, you know, the fact is that you got to have more experience for that. You got to have a name so that people already trust you, that investors know that you are the person, um, you know, who can implement the thing. And yeah, as, as simple as it sounds, you also got to have some budget also to take off. And, um, I think it's totally normal if our first, um, you know, companies or first projects, which the person is working on have nothing really to do with, uh, you know, changing the uh, world to a better place right away. But I just use as a school as, as like a project during which you learn, during which you um, learn the processes and things about yourself and to make communication with colleagues, with founders, with uh, customers. Where does this inner desire of yours come from to make the world a better place? I think a lot of people they say they want to make the world a better place, but they don't take active action towards it. It's just like like a sentence that is misused often, I think, nowadays. Where does this inner desire of yours come from? What is your like motivation? And in what kind of aspect do you want to improve the world? Yeah, it's an um, important question. I think I'm still thinking about this. It is connected for me, actually, with the question, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> and for, for myself, I realized that this question is not answered. I'm not sure I will be able to answer it, you know, like in two years, but rather uh, the meaning is actually to search for for the answer. <laughs> uh, so maybe we'll have to record uh, or grab a coffee afterwards to talk about this question. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, um, but um, one of the things which um, are even written on the sticky note uh, <laughs> next to my table is like one of the problems which I see in the world and which I would love to solve is um, actually that not enough people do that what they want and i i'm sorry to see that because it makes me unhappy it makes me unhappy to see that even in such a privileged world um in a privileged bubble where i live in the middle of europe in munich studying at, at a good university there are friends and there are people who are you know working at the, at the jobs which they don't like working at the projects where they're just looking to finish as soon as possible and waiting for for free time and for the weekend and then i'm thinking or looking back at that what's you know what i saw also the different stages of my life that most of the people on this planet are actually doing something work-wise right they're working just to sustain themselves financially and i would love to change that but also i would love to somehow help the people uh, transition to to the situation where work and happiness are closer to each other and you don't really differentiate those in your journey up until now, did you ever question your own path? Because you swam against basically the whole crowd who is like taking the mainstream path of I'm going to study afterwards, I'm going to get a job. And then at a certain age, I will retire. And you uh, swam against that. Most entrepreneurs like you who start at a young age actually do that. So did you ever question 
that path or thought how would my life be if I just took a job and and basically followed the the main path yeah and um I did question it and even you know taking an internship in a 500 fortune company was one of the ways to give it a try in order not to regret not doing it the thing is that it's you know trial and error I studied at the university in in Russia afterwards I moved um and I didn't feel like I was really fitting uh, at the university. Afterwards, I moved to Hamburg. In Hamburg, I was studying information engineering, but started working at a fintech startup, uh, which was sort of uh, Series A, Series B already at that point. And I was completely you know, far away from the whole startup ecosystem. So I was just enjoying the uh, <laughs> the fact that we can play a kicker and uh, drink uh, you know, a beer at the office. So it was something new for me to see and I was earning my first money. But um, at that moment, I also you know, just was stopping and sort of reflecting what's actually happening with, happening with me right now. And then a little bit more grown up Dima sees, oh, I'm actually a student, but I'm staying, spending most of my time at the office. Why? Because I'm like, I'm, I'm attracted to this more. And then uh, I made a decision to actually break up my um, studies there because it was still very technical. And through my work um, at a startup, I sort of transitioned to the position where I was working between um, the sort of the tech guys and the business was working at a, a BI, the business intelligence, and really enjoyed it and realized that I actually have never studied business. That's probably when I learned the world word entrepreneurship and started, you know, checking out the podcast, um, reading some books and realized that, well, you can study that. And probably if I want to go into this business world, I have to study it. And therefore, I moved to um, Munich and decided to finish my education there in Hamburg and my work and moved to Munich to study uh, management and technology, which was for me like a perfect combination of both. I can continue doing my you know, informatics side, but also, um, you know, have a uh, confirmed business studies um, <laughs> on my on my on my shelf in my brain. And um, that's was that was the point when I was already sure that I want to definitely try out being an entrepreneur, um, but I had no clue how to do that. And during my first semester in Munich, I was trying to focus on education one more time and was doing it um, not unsuccessfully and was thinking of myself as of a McKinsey material and uh, going 1.0 goal. Um, but then at some point, um, you know, doing some projects in the sites, I met my first uh, co-founder and that's actually how it all started that I realized I just give it a try. As you see, there were many moments where, you know, I was hesitating and I I'm thankful that I have this opportunity to play this game safe, that I even have a, dis like a, a choice um, to choose between different career paths, to choose between you know, universities and cities. And yeah. I think it's great. You know, German education, um, educational system in general, has given us students so much freedom um, to try out different things. You're not paying, paying tuition fees, leave of absence for actually founding your company, which is amazing. I've never heard that any other country offers that. <laughs> And uh, I think it makes sense that just in, in, in your um, 20s to tr try out all of that in order at least not to regret, which I'm you know afraid of that I'll regret not trying out something. Speaking of the, the time where you met your co-founder in Munich, are you talking about uh, Rainio, like your second uh, yeah, Rainio. start? Rainio, yeah. Rainio. Okay. I found Rainio very interesting, the, the idea, because it seemed like a very simple idea to me, but... If I thought about it, nobody, or I didn't know that there are any other competitors in that field. I'm not sure. Maybe you can clarify that, but it's basically a very convenient laundry pickup service. And I was thinking to myself, damn, that's like a very simple idea, but like very smart. It's very convenient for a lot of people. For example, yeah. here in, in Korea, I obviously have to do my laundry myself, but like, uh, sometimes it, it would be more convenient to just let other people do it and you just pick it up. And I think you guys even deliver it to them, right? Yeah. How did you, how was the process of, of doing that? How did it start with uh, Rainio? Yeah. Rainio is the on-demand dry cleaning, uh, laundry and shoes cleaning and delivery service. We had a big vision to, you know, build something like an uh, Uber, which you can open in any part of the world, whether you are, you know, like consultant, a business person who is traveling. And you're in London and uh, you pick up your phone, you press a button and can have your you know, laundry or your suit uh, picked up at any location at any time and delivered uh, back to your apartment, to your office or to the trunk of your car. But back to your question, yes, that's, that was a problem. I hate doing laundry. And Same I, here. Yeah, <laughs> feel you. 
Um, and I like um, wearing shirts, uh, which are looking disgusting <laughs> when they're not ironed, <laughs> especially if those are business shirts. How did it actually happen? Um, I was excited about the whole you know, sneaker boom, which I was not noticing uh, back in uh, Russia, but it was also starting now. And I just saw that people are wearing uh, their white sneakers everywhere, every time, any time of the year. It doesn't matter if there is snow outside or not. And um, I was looking at that, what companies do cleaning, because usually, you know, sneaker hats are people with enough money to pay for cleaning and for delivery service. And um, I found a a company which was doing it pretty well they also had a really nice brand and i didn't see anything like that um in europe or not on on such a scale and i thought it was cool my co-founder isa we just liked working together you know it was an intense um period we saw that we trust each other that we like the approach to work i think a month or two after the event uh, we literally talked um about that would be a good idea not to, you know, split apart because the project is over, which we was we were working on for the university. Uh, but actually, to um, yeah, stick to each other and think if we can continue doing something else. But back then, he was finishing uh, one of the courses at here as well at the Technical University of Munich, where you had to develop a uh, sort of a business plan for a um, for your idea and. By the way, really cool that university does something like that because you see, I mean, sometimes um, things. And um, he was doing a similar thing uh, with uh, laundry. And he uh, was already at the stage where had a really simple, you know, first uh, pitch deck with a couple of uh, screenshots. Mm -hmm. And after that course was over, I think a few months passed by and I think we were going for a run together and just started talking about that, exchange the ideas. And then the sneaker had problem with uh, laundry found each other. We somehow quickly decided that, you know, this differentiation point that we are offering everything, laundry, dry cleaning and sneakers and business shoes is a great way to start. And yeah, you're correct. It was 2019 May. And we just right away said, let's try out. Um, went and talked to a couple of laundries and then stick to, like with one of the uh, you know, laundries to start uh, testing it out soon. And um, this is how it went. Yep. And um, um, Isa brought in also another um, co-founder who was more on the technical side. And um, after, you know, a slow start and me still finishing my internship, it was a really tough time because working in the office sort of, um, yeah, I don't know, eight to five or to six, and then from seven to 12 or to one or till 3 a.m., on, on the startup, it was also time, I lived in Frankfurt, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, was also the beginning of my new relationship, and uh, which was a long distance relationship. So it was like all at once, but um, now looking back, I really enjoyed the time. I had a lot of energy and, and drive and just curiosity. And then I think we came back um, all from, you know, finishing the university, the projects, the internship, stabilizing the relationship. And uh, it was December to. 2019 when we said okay now we go all in and we focus on this 100 percent to launch in uh, spring did you guys have um, a scholarship or anything in that regard to finance your thing or did you finance it out of your own pocket the, the good thing is that in order to start a startup nowadays in most cases i'm sorry for you know the people who are looking into the hardware space or you know biotech and everything it's exciting. I have a lot of respect and that's super difficult because you actually need some proper budget for that, some yeah. proper funding. Uh, but in many cases, let's say this way, you need Figma, PowerPoint, some you know programming skills and uh, be brave to go out on the streets and talk to your customers, <laughs> you know? Um, and half of that, you know, half of the tools which you can use uh, are free or very, very hardly discounted for students. Um, I think we, you know, collected, you know, in total like 300, 400 euros to accelerate ourselves with uh, help from a freelancer who was helping us on the, one of the apps, um, mm -hmm. development, iOS. But besides that, um, we didn't invest much. I mean, the next step was to put money on Google ads and uh, try out whether there is demand, but of course we had to live on something because, um, I think all of, of us worked before, um, also to sustain ourselves and yeah, to be able to um, fully focus on a startup, you 
have to of course drop the uh, <laughs> the work uh, but again i think it's just great situation and the very privileged situation in which we're in that we as students can work you know 10 to 20 hours per week and if you are lucky enough to find a uh, apartment or to live in a dorm and i still live in a dorm um then you don't need you know more than 600 700 euros per, per month in munich if you're lucky with an apartment and that's something if you're lucky to, if you're lucky if you're yeah. lucky yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so many of my friends are paying 700 plus uh, because they don't have the opportunity to live in the dorms, but yeah, you're yeah. right. If you if you're lucky, then it should be around the, the price that you mentioned. Just move in with your founders, <laughs> or like that. If I may ask you, how much profit or revenue did you guys make on on that business? It's really difficult to, I think, calculate on that, and, th and I think it's also I'm not sure if I can, you know, uh, talk about all of that because we, as we were starting, we uh, had you know, zero money to invest. And uh, one of the deals with um, um, with a partner of the dry cleaning, you know, branches, Kingsguard, uh, who are now owning um, Rhino and uh, running it still right now, they basically gave us a really good deal about that, um, like really high discounts. And for some point, just to, you know, test out the processes with the first initial customers, we, um, yeah, we had a really good deal with them. So we yeah. went into minus and then we were you know, building on top from that I see. and um i mean long story short i think we'll continue talking about that but we basically oper been operating for a few months it was during corona times so during lockdown as well and and then we pivoted so the second um startup drew uh, drew vio there was a pivot from the original Rainio idea perfect i think we covered two of your businesses already so let's make it a full circle maybe you can elaborate very quickly also on on the last one you already mentioned it and you said it was a pivot from your second idea. So yeah, please just elaborate a little bit on how that process went. I mean, shortly back to Rainio, of course, that sounds like solving a real problem, but let's be honest, it's not the best business model. That's all about, you know, perfecting the, uh, the signal item, the unit economics. Back then, 2019, 2020, uh, when we actually started, um, that was before, you know, all the gorillas, flinks, get tears and um, all those guys and no angel investor or no VC, you know, was even thinking about pouring that amount of money into the uh, business like that. Slowly, we also realized that Corona, you know, actually, which also decided to launch itself more or less at the same time, time with us, helped us to, to realize that, um, yeah, maybe it's not the best perfect, um, the, the best business model. And after, you know, being live for a few months uh, without having an understanding whether we will have a pandemic right now for the next two weeks, two months or two years, there was a point when live gave us, you know, some, some more space to think, like the thing slowed down. We didn't have mm, that many orders coming in because we, you know, took the ads down and uh, didn't do any marketing to understand what's happening, to understand what's, uh, you know, what do we focus on now, whether we continue working um, on a product um, or do something else. You know, at some point it just clicked and we realized that, all right, we've developed a pretty powerful software solution, you know, all the backhand and front end. Um, why don't we um, sell it to all other small and medium businesses, allowing them to start their own delivery business? Why are we focusing only on one vertical, which is, you know, laundry and dry cleaning, and are not going to the flower shop and not going to the bakery and not going to, you know, the little fancy yoga studio from Max von Stadt. <laughs> we as customers um, these days, and many businesses realize this during pandemic, customers are really used to really perfect experience from such places like Amazon or right now, many players offer it where you have all the tracking, all the following of, of your deliveries, all the notifications, selection of the time slots of the areas where you want your products or services to be delivered. Uh, but looking back that on that, what was on the market, if you were a business who maybe had a website which was built, you know, 2005, 2010, in order to start doing the delivery business, you probably needed like a couple of consultants <laughs> to actually rebuild all the system. The idea was basically to build a super simple, you can call it like Shopify for delivery businesses. With the focus back then, focus was on the last mile logistics management optimization, 
So for the companies which already had their own logistics and delivery capacity, just allowing them very quickly setting up the online shop with the option um, of doing delivery and managing their whole order and delivery process. That was the point when we realized the best thing to do right now is actually to make a cut because one of the most important things is just to have, you know, 100% of the focus, which we, uh, well, I personally also didn't have during all those years. Having 100% of focus on uh, one um, idea, on one project helps a lot. And yeah, we started doing this. We basically, on the next day, we had a name, we had a new pitch deck, not to talk to the, to the investors or to somebody right away, just it helps when you put your thoughts on paper and pitch deck, you know, or business plan sort of is a good structure to see where you're missing some some important things. It was not an easy decision. This were some long discussions. We decided to make a cut, decided to basically leave, try to push the business to the, you know, the partner with one of the partners with whom we were working. And um, he is still, um, you know, operating and working with Rainio and the brand also belongs to, to them, to Kingsguard. I think they're not able to, you know, fully support the whole IT infrastructure, which we built like the apps and the just backend because they just don't have enough people, unfortunately, to support that. But it gave us, it gave us you know, freedom to continue to have some kind of focus on the new idea. You realized that you had to, to leverage your product that you've already built, your software, and expand it basically to other areas of the business to serve more people. So the Rainio team stayed the same and just basically transferred to the new business? Yes, Rainio team back then, still we were free people. And as soon as we transitioned, we started um, expanding. I mean, expanding is a loud, <laughs> you know, big word for that. But we started having, you know, interns and um, students who were working with us. And I think in the best times, we were like 10 to 12 people, something like that. You know, student, students doing their mandatory project studies or um, the informatics projects with us, which they had to do at the university. That was interesting it was because we still were the same founders, still the same people, and we had to change you know the way of working where it's not only you are working with yourself today and with your laptop <laughs> or you and and the customers but actually yeah there are some other people who are in the team and that's super exciting plus uh, what's another challenge i personally also didn't pay much attention to from the very beginning is the fact that we were still the same people uh, we had one kind of you know motivations at the beginning of the journey with uh, Rainio, but transitioning and pivoting to working on a new project um, you're not starting it from scratch. You are having a feeling that everything is, you know, sort of set and everything is ready to go. But actually, it's really important to reboot the system 100%. Talk to yourself, reflect like 100%. Am I still excited about that? Am I still passionate about the things which I was doing the past weeks? Or how is my life changing right now? How is my thinking about my work in the next, you know, six months is changing? Roles in the team are changing. Motivation is different. In case opportunity costs is the high topic. And the most important thing I think for the founders is um, communication. It's just talk, talk, talk openly about that. And it's really uh, easy to make a mistake not to talk in a good way to each other because you have a feeling that you spend 24 seven with each other and there is no need to, you know, say, hey, right now we sit, sit down and we give each other feedback or we talk about problems or we talk about our wishes and we open ourselves. But that's the most important thing. The time which should be blocked every week where you say, okay, right now we sort of turn down everything what's happening around me. We get off that roller coaster and that's now the time to be vulnerable. It's now time to open up and share and that's i mean i'm thankful that i learned that um, the practical way like there is no other way to learn it i probably also read it in the books or heard it in the podcast but <laughs> i think that's such an important message that you just mentioned first of all your sense of self-reflection oftentimes when we're immersed in deep work and we're just focused on the work we miss that opportunity to zoom out and just look from above on the situation it's too late for some people when they look back and they say I wish I would have stopped this earlier or took another path. So that's the first thing I, I just learned from you. The second thing is it's so important to have great conversation with your team members. I myself, like whenever I worked in a team with like very strong-minded people, you can get into conflict pretty fast because everybody is so strong-minded and everybody has a very strict opinion. And I think many businesses actually don't fail because their idea is bad, but because on a 
human basis, the people see that they have different destinations that they want to go to. Going back to that self-reflection, I wanted to ask you, many people have a lot of ideas floating around in their head, but they don't take the action because of fear, because maybe they think, is this really the right path for me? So what is your thinking process before you decide to go a specific path whenever you have an idea? What, what goes through Dima's head, basically, before um, pursuing that path? I think it's different now in uh, comparison with that, how it was before for the first time. I'm like sorry to see that I'm way more careful and way more thoughtful these days than I was before. Of course, that has like, you know, plus and minuses. But at, as a first time founder, as a person who is just trying out, you know, transitioning from this idea phase to let's do something right now phase, you don't question that much. You realize that's that's a, you know, wild idea and the likelihood of succeeding maybe is not high, but you have to be an optimist. You have to be you know, a person who just does the thing and sees whether it works out. Um, and back then as a first time founder, so I, and probably the, the person uh, who just does it for the first time, doesn't have all that pressure of friends and friends from VCs, friends from fellow founders and, um, all those experts who you're already connected to on LinkedIn, who will see that you fail, who will see that um you know you uh, didn't succeed or at least like openly i do care about that how it looks from outside i can uh, say this honestly and um as a first time founder um you probably don't think about that much because you just realized 100 right to make a mistake right now because it's my first time and everybody will understand but after some time you know with all that you know backpack of those connections and and people and experts in your uh, you know, network. I have a pressure that I have a need to deliver and actually to to reach some sort of level to impress, maybe. Um, and I'm talking about that that and um, uh, reflecting, and it's actually really funny that like you know this impressing is is important for me. But yeah, it it, it is also there. Do you feel like? that restricts yourself would you like wish that the brave Dima from from the past would kind of replace that mindset or do you think that maybe now that you have this risk all of the people looking at you you're taking risks but you're just taking more calculated risk basically yeah yeah i'm thinking i'm taking more calculated risk and maybe i was wrong about the impressing word i'm caring about the reputation because i saw myself talking to an investor that there is this CRM table, you know, a system where my name is written and it's written there interesting or not interesting. And if I'm doing right now the next thing, which is not interesting, uh, yeah, then maybe I'm, I'm just crossed out. <laughs> as basic as it sounds, that's sadly, this is how the word works. So um, you have to care about your reputation in that sense as well. I hope I'm still brave enough to, you know, uh, have those ideas in, and to transition from idea stage to implementation stage um, as quick as before. Yeah, there is way more calculation in between those phases, which of course slows down the process, but also there is way more thinking about that. What will the investors say? What will my fellow co-founders say? But I think with a thinking process beforehand, you might lose some time in the beginning, but you might save time down the road when you think the possible problems that might arise through, right? Definitely, definitely. So how does a typical day in your life currently look like? Do you still work 24 seven? On, uh, on 10 different ideas or where's your 100% focus on right now? I don't have like a typical day, I think, but <laughs> actually I decided to take the first half of the year 2023 in order just to say it this way, focus on myself and work on the, you know, fundament on the basis of, of this sort of tree which I'm or planting or house which I'm building which means taking care of my sleeping schedule making this a habit taking care of doing sports unfortunately yeah you can see that I'm wearing a fancy accessoire uh, recently I had a ski injury so I think I'll come back to sports but right now I'm you know slowing down and making sure that I'll be able to focus 100% on uh, my next uh, project and be you know completely stable in my life position no 100 percent that i have all my habits i have all my sleeping rituals and cold showers and whatever is advised to us and so that i don't think about that so right now i am 
um, finishing the university really in the last uh, you know stages writing my thesis um, came back to that and also happy about this because I'm in Germany still as a, a foreigner um, still on the student visa you know it doesn't allow me to do everything and there were a few right moments in my last project when I thought okay now I'm taking the risk and I'm you know dropping out <laughs> and it's not that easy it's it's the time when many technicali technicalities and many bureaucracy comes in and I have to leave the country and I have to reapply so right now I'm taking sort of the safe way to you know know that I can stay in this country especially because definitely I'm you know I feel that it's not the best way to go back to Russia these days. Yeah, I am, so to say, getting ready to 100% be ready to work again. I am super excited about being at the CDTM, the Center of uh, Digital Technology of Manage and Management. It's a great community. It's um, those are amazing people. I've only heard good things about that um, organization too. Dima, you're you've been an ambassador of Venture Scout at that sort of organization. You kind of slip into the role of an investor, right? And you look at potential startups that are successful. Coming from your bubble of being a founder yourself, and now slipping into the other side of the coin so to speak what are some lessons that you've that you've learned from that how did it shift your perspective on, on entrepreneurship in general i think i wouldn't say it really shifted my perception because while being a founder and talking to investors i think that was the time when i went from you know zero knowledge about that how does the whole startup startup ecosystem works out whether you got a bootstrap or you got to play the vc game in order to understand all of that as a founder you sort of have to get into the game so uh, therefore i didn't have culture shock <laughs> while uh, joining vc but i was always curious so um it's out of the curiosity i think i just at some point realized that it's my hobby i do read about startups i do talk to people i do brainstorm ideas and go through ideation process by myself sometimes i find myself sitting at uh, crunch base or linkedin or tech crunch you know and just uh, losing myself there and i thought at some point when we met with uh, guys um, from the first momentum ventures yeah why not make something useful out of it and I think that if not an entrepreneur, then I'll definitely go deeper into VC because frankly, that's partially also as a dream job. At an early stage VC, your work is to talk to super interesting young people, to, to dive in one industry or another, to figure out how this or other technology works, to do some you know analytics work. And if I'm anyways doing this by myself in my bedroom, why not to make it my, my job? So basically your two paths that you have in front of you now are either founding the next Rainio or the next, or um, going to the VC machine, right? Where would you see yourself? And this sounds like an interview question, like a job interview, but like, where do you, where do you think you will be in, let's say at 40, at age 40? <laughs> Interesting question. I hope to be a happy and fulfilled person. But what does that mean? Like, it's very broad. So how do you define happy and, and fulfilled? I am very curious and I'm very, I'm like, I'm willing to take the, you know, ownership of, of work and ownership of building something. And as we talked earlier, I have a need to prove some things in this world or impact some lives of people. I hope by the age of 40 to be able to do some of that so to help to make some other people happy even if it's just you know improving some processes or automating some things or maybe something bigger or laundry uh, or laundry or laundry i mean it will make david <laughs> yeah. happy this i already know <laughs> definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah and i'm i'm definitely starting as an entrepreneur and uh, i think i'll bring way more into the vc game afterwards with having more experience building the product, building the service myself and leading the team, because I'll have a way better um, understanding of that, what kind of issues and what kind of problems um, entrepreneurs are um, going through. All right, Dima, today we talked like a lot about super interesting stuff and I definitely gained a lot of value from that. And because I respect your time, I think we should wrap it up soon. But to kind of summarize for, for all the people who are watching or listening to, I think my lessons that I took away from are that you should just do it because you have the opportunity, especially if you have the privilege, of course, it always depends on the circumstances. But let's say you are in America or Europe, you probably have the privilege of just doing it. 
And there's so many resources out there to just approach whatever idea you have to, to make this world a better place. Also, the sense of high self-reflection is super important because also for me, I don't want to regret anything when I'm older and at my deathbed, looking back at how I wasted my time or how I could have done something better. And communication with your team is uh, very important. And if you need a laundry, you can also uh, check out Dima's uh, brilliant idea. Yeah, I think that was it. Dima, do you have any last comments to, to the audience before we wrap this up? No, I feel a lot of pressure saying something smart. <laughs> yeah, I think, David, you uh, summarized it really well. And one more time, if you're thinking about starting something by yourself, if you feel like you have an urge of building, um, go for it. Like really, you will have an opportunity to come back to university. You will have an opportunity, you know, start that corporate career. This will not run away, but timing and people and your curiosity and, you know, this moment of energy might not be there again. So just go for it if you have it. And if you're in the situation where you can allow yourself to. Thank you, Dima. I think that was the best way to end this episode. Definitely check out um, Dima's socials as well as hopefully wish him a, a healthy recovery from his ski accident. Yeah, thank you so much, Dima. I think we'll wrap this up now. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me.